Welcome to Careers in Discovery, your window into the world of leaders in pharma and biotech. Brought to you by Singular Talent, making hiring better for organizations involved in drug discovery and R&D. Sam Barker is the VP of Business Development at SomaServe, a drug delivery company developing a transformative nanoparticle platform to tackle the problems caused by biological barriers. Sam joined us to discuss his career to date, what business development means in a biotech startup, and transitioning from a research position into a commercial role. This week on Careers in Discovery, I'm delighted to be joined by Sam Barker of SomaServe. Sam, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. Good to see you. Um, so, Sam, we're, we're going to talk a bit about your career today. To start with, I'm really interested to hear more about SomaServe. You guys are tackling a really big drug discovery challenge and drug delivery challenge. Um, talk to us a bit about how you're doing it. Yeah, well, thanks very much for, for having me on. And um, being able to talk a bit more about SomaServe and kind of our, our new company, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a startup. We're based on the paper and research campus in Cambridge. Um, and we, we moved there about three months ago after incubating the company within University College London. Mm -hmm. But you're right, this, this challenge that we're trying to tackle, um, essentially, has kind of been coined as the delivery problem. So many people are now aware of these new advanced therapeutics coming through. Um, and that includes things like gene therapies and something we might, as an umbrella term, call nucleic acid-based therapeutics or NYATs. And that also includes biologics as well, to a degree, um, you know, that these are really transformational drugs coming through. We're able to target drug targets that have never been sort of tractable before. Mm -hmm. But these new molecules do have certain issues in terms of their drug likeness. So how can we deliver them to the site of action where they're going to have their effect and, and be therapeutic? And that's probably been uh, you know, identified as the biggest limitation in this field at the moment. Yes. And it's something that's actually really come to light, the vaccine development. So up, up until a couple of years ago, who within sort of the non-scientific community was talking about mRNA and nanoparticle delivery? Mm -hmm. And yet now it's, you know, common parlance. Um, so we're working kind of in that field, but in particular trying to tackle some of those limitations that not yet addressed with some of these more crude technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and forgive, forgive me anyone who's working on those technologies i've just called crude but um no i mean this essentially uh so nats have this massive potential but the limitations are that they need to be delivered intracellularly uh they need to avoid clearance by off-target organs and and many of the existing technologies naturally go to the liver right. um where they're clear so it's very difficult to target other organs especially the brain and then they need to access the correct tissue within those organs mm -hmm. um, and then interact with the desired cell type. And it's always in a, within a complex tissue microenvironment. And the brain has always been a real challenge because you have something called the blood brain barrier, which effectively stops many molecules from passing into the brain. Yes. Um, and and it, even if they are able to cross into the brain, once they're within there, to be able to reach their target at an effective dose is really challenging. Um, and so then, you know, the, the, the problem even goes further once we're talking about things like DNA or mRNA, that once you reach the cell of interest, you have to be internalized. And that happens through endocytosis. Mm -hmm. And then even within the cell, once released into the cytoplasm, so the, the general milieu of the cell, you have to reach the site of action. So there's really a huge need for different technologies to kind of address each of those parts. Yes. Um, and what we're doing is is developing a polymer-based nanoparticle. The platform's called Polynaut. And essentially these vesicles are, um, are spheres with a, a lumen in the center, so an open space in the center where we can encapsulate all sorts of molecules to deliver as drugs. Yes. And so we, we're working at the moment with molecules like plasmid DNA, mm -hmm. um, mRNA, siRNA, um, and also looking at things like antibodies, peptides, and small molecules. Um, and the way that we cross the blood-brain barrier is by sort of functionalizing the surface of these vesicles. They're about, about 
100 nanometers so we're really working on the nano scale here yes um and we're putting bioinformatically derived ligands that are kind of perfectly matched to the cell of interest so they're they're really hyper selective against anything you don't want to hit mm -hmm. and going to trip just for the, the cells of interest and then internalized and then building additional technologies to traffic the drug once released from the vesicle to the site where it's going to be effective. So that's the base sort of technology that SomaSurf are working on. Yes. Um, and as a company, our sort of objectives are really to work in partnership with people like pharmaceutical companies, biotechs, and also academia to kind of really mature this technology and, and mm -hmm. take it into drug development. Yeah, makes sense. And, and it's a really interesting challenge because of course, the barrier stopping things getting into the brain generally is a good thing, right? <laughs> and, and, but it sounds like you've kind of taken the, the um, position that it's not just the size that's going to allow delivery to happen. It's also then the, the functionality of the, the particle. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at a lot of drugs, you, you can, with some small molecules, you can get penetration into the brain. Mm. But to, to be able to deliver an effective dose, you're very often going above what is toxic to the rest of the body. because you, So you can't just rely on sort of a passive diffusion. Yes. Um, so one of the ways we tackle that is instead of just having small nanoparticles that can sort of randomly travel across, the nanoparticles actually interact with the... Um, brain endothelial cells, so the, the blood brain barrier itself, and they induce something called transcytosis. So they essentially create little tubules through the cells and traffic themselves through to the other side, still in a whole state. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the vesicles are unchanged on the other side. And so, yeah, in that respect, we're not disrupting what's really an integral protector for the yes. brain, but we're kind of using the body's own um, cell biology to be able to facilitate the, the drug delivery. So it's really cool in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you, you talked about sort of the, the partnering objectives of the company, and, and uh, I want to talk about your role a little bit in that, but I'm assuming the obvious people that you're looking to partner with are people developing drugs for neurological diseases, neurodegeneration, these sorts of things. Yeah, so we've had quite a lot of interest in that respect. Um, largely, you know, a lot of the top 20 pharma have all got programs running in looking at nucleic acid therapeutics mm -hmm. and they all have some degree an interest in neurological disorders whether that be neuro-oncology but also with our aging population we look at diseases of aging mm -hmm. um, and neurodegenerative diseases where again a limitation to, to tackling them is being able to target the right sites of action yes um but you know one of the benefits are whilst we can target across the blood brain barrier we also have ongoing collaborations to target other areas that are otherwise intractable so if we think about drugs to reach the lungs or to reach the pancreas they can be also quite challenging and the same technology can be deployed either way okay so my role is really about kind of communicating with these partners and working out what their strategic interests are and then trying to shape kind of how we would deploy our technology to kind of fit their needs and their challenges yeah. And, and this is one of the things I was going to ask you about, actually, because um, not every company would have a VP of business development at this stage in its in its life. Um, but it, it sounds like what you're trying to do is really understand, well, what does the problem look like from the pharma company's point of view, from the point of view of the people that we're trying to help right from the beginning? And how do we develop a solution that's that's going to work with that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really um, interesting business model to me. Um, like I've always really focused on what I would call platform technologies mm -hmm. um, and they're from the from the start point they're really interesting because lots of biotech companies can find say a target or a drug molecule and you can raise a lot of money um, to then go and develop them as a drug and you've kind of got a one track there you know you can develop that drug for several different indications maybe but you're really you're pinned on you, you've chosen your horse to back. Yes. Whereas with early stage platform technologies, when they come out of academia, they've got a huge amount of potential. They're really interesting. Loads of ideas that you can you can try out, but you need to kind of find that platform disease fit. So what 
what's the best application for them, where are they most useful, and then also from a BD point, point of view, where are they most valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can use through this partnering sort of early collaboration play, you can use the capital you've raised very cleverly to just generate some proof of concept data, and then you can work in collaboration to generate other data. And you can use that same data multiple times to, to work with multiple partners. Yes. Yes, makes sense. I, I want to talk a bit more about business development more broadly, uh, uh, probably a little later on, um, because I think um, there's, there's perhaps some, uh, some misunderstanding sometimes about what business development is and what the function does and, and things like that. So we, we'll get into that. But I think probably a good way to get there is to talk a bit about your career and how you got there. Um, so you, you are, a, of course, a scientist, a researcher by training. T tell us a bit about where that started from so so why science why this career for you where did where did your passion for it come from oh gosh that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> it's it's rare um where you actually reflect backwards on yes. these things so much <laughs> especially you know when well all of us everyone's always so, super busy so to take a mm -hmm. minute back and actually think it's interesting um i, I would say you know there are people who are really academically minded do really well in school like definitely wasn't um you know i i coasted very right. you know for the majority of it until i nearly failed my as levels and had to kind of get on with my a levels <laughs> um but you know the only thing that really resonated at school was science okay. um and so that was kind of where what led me into undergraduate studies in biology uh and then it really clicked when i sort of did my first lab work like mm. first self-directed research project and then you you realize that actually what you're learning you can put into pro you can put into practice and actually create something create data learn something new um and so that's probably the spark mm -hmm. um and then yeah so following on from my undergraduate studies i actually went to work on uh for the nhs blood and transplant so it was processing blood that had been donated getting it ready right. to go into into patients um, and yeah i really like that so it's that science in action but really by that point all of the science has been done it's just technical work you have to follow processes mm -hmm. protocols everything has to be safe and gmp um and so there's not really much that you can use your brain you can't really problem solve at that point so right. that's kind of what led me into thinking oh, i need to do a phd if i'm actually gonna be able to make a difference and make decisions you know um and so yeah i went went on to do a phd and and that was really where i had my first glimpse of drug development because yes. my phd was broad between uh, the university of exeter um dstl at port and down oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and then also at the university of dundee their drug development unit or drug mm -hmm. discovery unit rather is is a really uh it's quite a, an amazing facility up in scotland for yes. screening small molecules um so there i met just a lot of people with pharma background as well as research background and that was really helpful and informative um and actually during my time as a phd student i did a residential competition called biotech yes which is like okay. a young entrepreneur scheme yeah 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 um yeah, so that was fantastic because you you kind of went along. Your challenge was to design a company over a couple mm -hmm. of days and then pitch it at the end. You know, just tackling some imaginary problem with an imaginary technology. But we met all of these entrepreneurs and people who built up biotech companies and startups, and that was just really exciting. Yes. Um, yeah. So that was kind of my academic point where I thought, you know, I love science, but I'm. I'm not just going to be able to spend my whole time researching one molecular pathway and writing publications. I need to go and apply it somewhere. And yes. Drugs seem like the interesting, obvious thing because they kind of help society and have a greater overall point, I guess. Mm. Mm. And it sounds like that program was very industry aligned compared to perhaps some of the other programs that are out there. So that was, that probably gave you a lot more insight than perhaps most people would have at that point. I think so. It depends a bit on universities um, and how advanced their knowledge transfer technology partnership office, whatever they call it, is. Sure. So I know that university students in Cambridge, you know, they get a really 
like early exposure to startups, not least because most of their professors have got their own companies nowadays. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, same for Oxford, York, Manchester, you know, it, it's, it's really it's taken off in the past 10 years, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but when I was doing this, so yeah, probably sort of seven, eight years ago, that was, um, that was kind of the first I'd ever heard of it. It was a real eye opener. So yeah, I was quite fortunate there. Yeah. And so, so you, you saw then that this was the route you wanted to go down to apply the, what you'd learned about biology and about science in general to, to drugs. Um, talk us through the next step, how you, how you then took that step into, into doing that. Yeah. So it's, it's actually completely unrelated to science um, okay. because during my, you know, serendipitous, I think, because during my PhD, um, well, I should caveat, I'm talking quite a keen cyclist. And mm -hmm. so whilst I was doing my PhD, I was also racing for a sort of semi-professional, semi-amateur cycling team. Um, and one weekend, I was due to do a time trial up in Cambridge. So I drove up from Exeter to Cambridge. And I don't know if you've ever done sort of amateur sports, but you're sort of usually in, the, in a cold car park on a yes. sort of November morning. <laughs> Uh, getting changed and you know trying to cover your modesty with a towel and I was, yeah. I was next to this other chap and we were just chatting away um I said what I was doing and he said oh I'm just actually I'm just starting a startup company and I'm currently at Ashok Venkit Raman's lab which is at the, the Hutch in Cambridge and mm -hmm. it was so it was Graham McKenzie who was the chief scientific officer for Foremost yes so it was just as they were about to spin out Foremost um and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And obviously we sort of chatted for a little bit before we went off to do our bike riding, get our cake. Um, and that's really kind of where that triggered from. So a few more discussions with, with other people at Foremost, and there was also a link through Horizon and other people I knew. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, ended up that sort of Christmas Eve, I got a phone call from Graham saying, would you like to come and work with us? And so coming into January and February, it was like, quick finish writing up my thesis hand that in on the friday move to cambridge start my first job at foremost on the monday um and so i was employee number six i think yes. at foremost um and it was you know great such a cool environment proper startup where you have to assemble your chair and your desk before you can do any work <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah yeah and then just had yeah two amazing years as a scientist working under graham so just learning like so many like broad different areas of science um and sort of the old tricks of the trade and mm. learning about the ecosystem of cambridge and startup companies and biotech culture um and then kind of transforming into first like an alliance manager for these collaborations we had yeah. um, where the scientific background was really helpful uh, and then you know, moving more fully into business development yes and knowing Graham a little bit, he was one of the early guests on our show, actually, which is, I think, where we first bumped into each other. But uh, uh, I'm sure you won't mind me saying that must have been a really useful sort of almost apprenticeship because there aren't there aren't many people that have the experience that he has that have stayed as hands on as he has. Oh, completely. I mean, he's now a close friend and it's it's really nice when you meet those people through your career because you can trust them completely and they give you great, you know, great advice. But also, yeah, like you say, it was an entire apprenticeship because mm. in the lab, the guy's got magic hands. Everything just seems to work for him. <laughs> he can think around problems in a, in a second. And really, it was just two, two, three years of trying to keep up with his brain and understand what he's saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's amazing what can happen when you're getting changed in the cold on a November morning. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> so you, you touched on it there. You started to make this transition into, into this alliance management role. Um, why that transition first of all and just tell us a bit about that yeah well i think you know even starting uh, at foremost i knew that i wanted to be in the lab but not forever forever right um hands-on research itself can be really interesting and really rewarding it can also be quite slow you know you have a very particular problem you need to deal with or experiment or study um and you have to perfect it, but you know, you're only working on one thing. Yes. And I really like working more broadly across projects where lots of stuff comes in and you can kind of get a bigger picture. The transition to Alliance Manager was, was really because the company started several collaborations with pharmaceutical companies. 
Um, and it's really important to have somebody who's literate in the science so mm. that you can actually design those collaborations in terms of the activities and work packages with being able to understand what the science is coming up from the partner, but also the, the capabilities and things like timelines, costs and resource needed to actually do those. In that case, it was it was target discovery screens. Um, and it was just really, I found it really interesting because you get to talk with more people, you get to see what's going across the company on a, on a broader level. Yes. Um, and so the other you know, aspect of wanting to join a startup was wanting to learn more about biotech and company formation, company growth. And so it also meant that I was able to sort of apprentice under people like uh, Neil Torbett, who was the chief business officer, and Chris Torrance, who obviously had a, a really long history mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur and a successful you know business leader um so i really like having the two parts to my job yes yeah no I, I can certainly see the appeal and i think um i'll come back to one of the things i mentioned earlier um for i guess for people who don't know much about business development that can sometimes especially scientists there can sometimes be a resistance to it because the, the natural response or the natural reflex is to think it's a sales role, which of course there, there are some elements of that involved and that it takes them away from science. You know, t tell us a bit about what it's really like in an early stage biotech and what, you know, where you spend your time, what you get involved in, all those kinds of things. I, I mean, I was worried too, actually. Right. When, when I started, when I think I changed my job title to something like business development manager, I was a bit worried that people would think I spend my time selling plastics and, <laughs> um, you know, sales. Uh, and I guess if it's a company that have got a mature product profile yes. or portfolio, then it, it can be. Uh, but in a company where your offering isn't fully defined, um, the science is quite new. I'd say my role is, it, it sits certainly in a small company, it sits all across. Um, so the, the objectives that you set as a company, so the, the areas where you want to develop the technology into and invest your time and resource, it's important for business development to give a market steer to that, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you're actually going in the right direction. It's something that will be licensable or sellable or commercializable. Um, and then I would say, you know, the majority of the time is communicating with partners to understand with them, keep touch on what's going on with them, what their challenges are, and then try to communicate really effectively what you're doing, what the benefits and advantages are. Yes. Um, but ultimately, yeah, you need to shape agreements and contracts and you need to make sure that you're delivering value for the work that you do and that you're going to generate some return on your investment. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to report back to your shareholders and, and make sure that they and your investors and, and keep them happy on the progress you're making. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's a really key component of any healthy business, right? Because you can be doing the best science in the world and if nobody knows about it and or nobody wants to partner with you on it, then the company is not much point. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's great if it's you know government funded and yeah. in a university but it's small companies uh, the aim is to um you know transform it and mm. and the, like i said earlier the nice thing about platform technologies is i could be having a conversation with one group about neuro-oncology in the morning and then we could be talking about inflammatory diseases or anything else in the, in, in in the afternoon so you need to have a really need to be really quick in terms of yes. getting up to speed on stuff. Yes. And, and I suppose, you know, making that transition and doing it within a company in which you'd been actually working on developing the platform itself, you obviously have that understanding of the science and the technology as it as it's been put together and how it can be applied and that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a core understanding there. And you mentioned you had some really good mentors who who had a lot of experience in the commercial side of the biotech sector. You talked about some of the entrepreneurial things that you'd done during your university career. Um, had you had any sort of training or experience in the commercial side of any business or anything like that at that point? No, not really. Um, okay. So I, we did do the Barclays Scale Up program, which was at the Cambridge Judge. Hmm. And that was really useful because again, really experienced um, business leaders and mentors, not necessarily with the scientific side, um, but how to scale a company. Yes. Uh, and I really liked that, I took a lot away from it. But then I actually went and canvassed a couple of different people who, within the industry who had done MBAs or not done MBAs. 
um, to see whether it was worth it. Because obviously it's quite a big commitment time and yeah. money wise. Um, and, you know, kind of came to the conclusion that actually it's better to learn by doing. Um, and majority of this stuff, you know, you can find on YouTube or Google if you want to self-educate. Mm. Uh, but the best thing I could do for my career was just try and get as much exposure as possible. So try and get involved in as many different things um, and just make sure I'm trying to learn from every opportunity. Um, and, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for more learning further down the line. Um, but, yeah, I kind of felt like at the time, probably get further quicker by just trying to yeah. get stuck in. It's, do you know what? It's a question that I get asked a lot by people thinking about this sort of transition is, do you need to do an MBA? And and I guess I I never did one, I you know, um, but I can see the value in them. I think particularly if you're going to work in a corporate environment, really, really essential. Um, I think they can be useful for people in a startup environment. But if you have good people around you and have good mentors, as you say, there are other ways you can read the books, you can you can go to seminars and you can do that sort of stuff. So I think some of it's about how you learn as well, isn't it? If you're someone who learns by doing stuff and experiencing it and making the mistakes and things like that, then um, that that can be the best route to do it. If you're if you're sort of more academic in your uh, in your just learning style and theoretical in your learning style, then um, um, then it, it, it's a good way to um, to get the basics. Although I do think one of the most useful books I've ever read about business is a book called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, I think that's another area where I've sort of had some some interesting mentorship because so, you know, Foremost was a an early stage Series A privately funded or privately mm. um, investment um, company. And then I moved to Minotech Pharma who were dual listed on AIM and NASDAQ. And like you say, once you go into that corporate level with the additional sort of um, requirements and rules, that was a really steep learning curve. Um, yeah, I can imagine. What, what do you think of then moving from a scientific role, the research role into this business development role, whether it's you know what you did at Foremost or what you've done since then, what are the most important things you've learned in that transition? What are the skills you've had to develop? What are the what are the things you've learned about business? You know, what what are the key things that stick in your mind? Do you think? Um, I think it the job is so broad um, that it's difficult to to take too much away from because really every every week there's something that would be you know mentionable there. Yes. Um, I think that business development very often can sit slightly aside to the core company sort of organogram uh, if you think about a science company you might have the ceo at the top and then you have a, a chief technology officer or similar and then a team in the team of the team you have kind of direct line management business development often sits to the side of that if it's mm -hmm. not the core operation of the company and so you have to somehow you know work in a way that you can communicate and influence at different levels within the organization without necessarily having you know authority or you know a level of seniority yes um so that's really important being able to kind of talk with the bench scientists on their terms uh investors stakeholders and ceo on their terms and pick out what's important um and then within that let's say setting clear expectations is is and sticking to them is really important because people will want always want more you'll always mm -hmm. want to give more because you're you know you're a people pleaser if you're in business development and so you need to make sure you're not over promising um and but but also that you're holding people to to timelines and costs and things like that yeah. which isn't always easy no no i think um Good business development people that I know, they let less things go than most other people. <laughs> they let less things slip. That's it's part of the discipline, isn't it? You chase stuff and you make sure stuff happens and you you you're on top. Yeah, of you can things. be really proactive, yeah. yeah. And organized, which is sometimes, you know, where I'm I have to work harder. <laughs> um and then so you talked about um foremost, of course, and you you touched on Mida Tech there as well. Just just talk us through that next bit of your career. So from from foremost onwards. Yeah. So uh, you know, Formos was a lovely family environment. And like I, I said about having those people above me who I could really trust and rely mm. on. 
and that became to be a point where I was actually thinking, well, it's a, it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword because whilst I feel comfortable and safe and I can trust that them, how, how many of those achievements could I do on my own? Um, do I end up, if I've always got a safety net or somebody else's re- reputation to rely on, how right. do I know that it's off my own benefit? And I'd also been only ever really worked at that very early point in drug discovery. So I wanted to get more exposure to somewhere where I could perhaps have another level of seniority. Mm -hmm. So move move up the ladder and have more autonomy over what I do. Um, But move into a slightly different structured company. And one crucial for me was a company that was at the clinical stage. So moving kind of further along in drug development. and so I went to Mydatech Pharma, who are based in Cardiff. Um, and it was it was perhaps a contentious move, actually, because Foremost was very safe. Yes. Um, I had a really good career trajectory there. Mydatech was, well, is a, a dual-listed company. They've been around for some time, actually, and they, their share price fluctuates and their investment fluctuates. Um, uh, but the, the point at which I joined them, they had a, a drug molecule or drug program that had just completing was just completing its phase one trials. Mm-hmm. Data was looking really good. So the aim was they're going to take a big investment, take that into a phase three pivotal trial, and I'd be coming in to help with the licensing efforts on that and also bringing in new partners to license the platform. And that was March, January, and it was January 2020. Yes. So that's like the precursor to <laughs> everyone's story over the next two years. Absolutely. Um, we all had best laid plans. Yeah. So um, come March, we, we were planning a fundraise and obviously the world shuts down. Mm-hmm. Um, the markets dip and so that didn't happen. Um, and so within sort of three months of joining, it was on a call and two thirds of the company had been made redundant and mm. the CEO who'd recruited me had resigned. And so that was like a big shock at that point. And suddenly, you know, you know, we, we meant, you mentioned earlier about what are the formative moments? Yes. The formative moments I think are probably correlative with the least comfortable moments. Yeah, um, often they are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, we kind of scrambled to, it was really useful for me because we scrambled to look at the technology, what its strengths were, what its new applications could be and how we could pivot a little mm. bit to engage with partners and make the investment that we did have go further and maybe try to reposition for you know, more valuable, more modern markets. Um, and so we were actually, you know, within a couple of months, we'd set up a, a collaboration that's recently been disclosed as with Janssen. Mm-hmm. Um, and also we had a, another one looking at how we could apply the MyDetect technology to their programs. Um, and that meant that we could kind of refocus and, you know, realign the team and have like a new purpose. It also meant that we could re, uh, refund raise. So yes, that gave me a lot of satisfaction because I meant that I could kind of because I was really worried about my colleagues you know and the company mm. being around for a while we didn't want to see it go under um, and yeah gave it a nice new focus and meant that we could like realign and, and go through that period of uh, just being really critical on everything we were doing uh, and make sure it was important and so they're kind of along that way now yes um, so yeah overall challenging time but I'm really you know glad that I went through it yeah, and I think, you know, individuals in their careers come out of those things stronger, but I think companies do too as well, right? Because it, it makes, as you say, it makes you focus on what is working, what's not working, the stuff that's not working, how do we do it better? The stuff that's working, how do we do more of it? Where is the value? Where is the, you know, all of those questions that you should, of course, be asking at all times, but it's easy to just get on with the day-to-day sometimes. Yeah, it's easy to grow a bit fat as well, actually. I True. mean, to use a it's a, probably a poor term, but you know, when you're a startup company, you really think about how you deploy your money and you make sure that every penny counts. You know, we'd be on phone calls to suppliers saying, can you do me a discount? Can you make it cheaper? We'd be looking at every expenditure saying, can we push that a little bit further down? And I think sometimes companies that have been through that IPO and have had a glut of money, they mm. start spending without really thinking. So it's another tro- opportunity to really yeah, cut down and say, what do we actually need to do? And yeah. And so having that small startup background was actually quite useful then. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, of course, led us to, to SomaServe, and, and we talked about that a bit at the top. Um, we've touched on some of these things already, I would imagine. <laughs> um, but looking back, I suppose, to, to maybe those first steps into business development or those first steps into industry or, or you know, wherever is appropriate. What, what do you think, of, from a career point of view, are the key things that you've learned along the way? What are the things that you would pass on to others who maybe want to follow the same journey, whether that's getting into drug discovery or that's getting into business development as a scientist? What, what are those sort of little things that you've picked up that you think have been, you'd have liked to have known at the beginning, I suppose? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I was thinking about this. If mm. I go back to the beginning, I probably wouldn't have accepted the advice because I'd be so arrogant to think that I actually already knew <laughs> yeah. it and didn't need help. Um, uh, so yeah, try and just take stuff on board, try and learn mm. from every opportunity. Um, but I mean, I think in general, I would try and avoid giving advice. Um, a song we had playing in the lab, we had this really cool team. We were you know, working in the lab and I don't know if you know Baz Luhrmann, Sunscreen. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, a quote in that song that says something along the lines of, be careful whose advice you buy, but be patient with those who supply it. Uh, and that advice is um, like a way of fishing pish, up the past from the disposal, wiping mm. it off, painting the ugly parts, recycling it for more than it's worth. And I think I'd probably subscribe to that, not to be too <laughs> cynical. <laughs> But it is an important thing to remember that anyone who gives you advice is it's rarely 100% altruistic. You know, true. People always have a slightly ulterior agenda. Um, you know, and the field moves fast. So if somebody did something 20 years ago, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the way to do it nowadays. So no, true, true. Um, well, it, it, I'll I'll position that a little bit differently then because I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> If you look at the things that you've learned then and the things that, that have been most important to your journey, what, what are those things? What are the things that you think you've developed that have been helpful for you? It is certainly setting expectations, like I said. So yes. being confident to actually talk to people. Um, many scientists are slightly introverted or shy or not the most socially you know, gregarious. If you, for me, the turning point was thinking, of networking as part of my job mm. so it's literally it's my job to go into this event and talk to people find out what they're doing and they're not going to look down on me as some you know why is this person talking to me yes it's it's their job as well we're yeah. all there to do it and then that does kind of help a little bit it's it's amazing how easy it is to forget that right that um you might be feeling nervous about going and speaking to that person but they're sat there feeling nervous about going and speaking to everyone as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, then the other thing is that when you're British, you don't always want to talk about money. You think that it's like, a, it's like, oh, it's a bit dodgy. You know, I don't want to, but business development, your job is to go and get money. So yeah, yeah. ultimately there has to be a transaction and you have to discuss for how much stuff costs and you have to justify it and you have to inflate it a little bit to, mm -hmm. you know, to make a profit. So not being embarrassed about that stuff or, you know, just be able to talk about it openly can kind of help. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so it's it's obviously very early in the journey for you and for SomaServe and and uh, you know it sounds like you've got a really exciting uh, platform that you're developing. What what's next? What does 2022 hold for you? Do you think? So it's, it's going to be a, a really transformative year. Um, so going into February, we've got two pharma collaborations, mm -hmm. one ongoing and one's kicking off, and that's a pretty substantial collaboration. It's going to take us sort of over into about three years so yes. these are really substantial and they're going to properly um substantiate our data sets uh, and really prove out and validate the technology so they're mm -hmm. they're really important and so i want to firstly we need to execute on those and that's gonna be our, our priority as well as growing the team um and expanding our technology so you know building into new bits as well we've got some good plans and so then, there, yeah, there's the potential to enter into further collaborations, but also to explore an internal pipeline and potentially a, a larger investment round. Yes. Um, ultimately, for me, I think we want to prove the technology out for a broad range of modalities. So different types of cargo um, and then different disease indications. So what I said earlier, we can target different cell types. So the more of those we can exemplify, the better. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know, wouldn't it be great if Somaserve played a part in you know bringing a new drug to patients? That would be the ultimate aim. Um, yes. You know, particularly in areas that otherwise don't have effective treatments, or you know, you can't get drugs to. If we could even play a part in that, that would be kind of like the goal. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's a really important problem that you're trying to solve, and it's it's so it's so challenging to develop the therapies themselves. Of course, that that finding a solution to delivery part. I think you know could be really transformative so um we of course wish you the best of luck with it sam um thank you very much thank you so much for joining us thanks for joining us on careers in discovery and don't forget to subscribe for more insight into the world of drug discovery and r d do take a look at our sponsors singular talent and their mission to make hiring better for companies and individuals in drug discovery and R&D. You can find them at www.singulartalent.io. See you next time.